Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, it's Frankie G, baby. Frankie Griffin. Uh, hello, Jay. Thank you so much for having me. And also, I have to say, I've really been enjoying your stand-up clips. Oh, because I you. miss stand-up, and most of the clips online are from, like, the worst people uh, who are still doing shows and giving COVID. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yours are great, especially the... the the uh the, the roast battle <laughs> clips. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it so was so good. nice to to dig through the archives and post all those over the past couple months. Makes me miss uh, makes me miss the show. But hey, I mean that's yeah. you know yeah. hopefully if we get some vaccines and more vaccines. people. Vaccines. <laughs> we get herd immunity and uh, and then also everybody uh, stops breathing out all the uh, bad stuff. Yeah, and then we can get back to doing stuff for free in the back of a bar. Exactly. That that's the goal. That's the saddest goal, but that's the goal we need. <laughs> um, hey, speaking of creatives who have toxic uh, <laughs> toxic pastimes, Phantom Thread. That's the movie uh, you wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah. Well, when you said what's a movie you hate, the first thing I was like, Phantom Thread. Just immediately it came to mind. <laughs> of all the movies in the past, you know, three and a. a a piece years that have come out mm-hmm. phantom thread is still just sticks in my mind as one that i absolutely hate is terrible and didn't deserve any praise interesting this is uh you know there's a couple of reasons why i would imagine somebody <laughs> wouldn't like phantom thread and i want to know what yours yeah. more specifically is because i i i didn't want to guess because sure, sure. it's a it, this is a movie that is it's a tricky one. It's clearly not for everybody, but I don't want to <laughs> discount and say that your reason is garbage because I think your reason <laughs> might be entirely valid, even though I like this movie. Um, so what's your, what's your, what's your beef with it? What is like, how did you feel first time you watched it? What's going on in your head now having watched it again? So first time I watched it, cause I, okay, let me say off the bat. I, I don't generally like drama. Okay. Um, and one reason is is that characters in drama, like drama, is the more serious, respected genre. But characters mm-hmm. in drama act more insane, less human, and less grounded than any comedy I've ever seen. If I wrote a comedy where the characters behave like they do in Phantom Thread, everyone would be like, I, 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 this, is, "This is unbelievable! Why would I make this?" <laughs> They're just so <laughs> disconnected. Uh, Harold <laughs> or Harry and Lloyd. Behave uh-huh. more realistically <laughs> than the characters. Than Reynolds and Alma do. Dumb and Dumber is a more believable <laughs> series of events <laughs> than what goes on here. They don't act like people. They're all disturbed weirdos. And I think it comes down to the fact that Paul Thomas Anderson is a weird piece of shit. He is very weird. He he doesn't tend to make movies involving people who are well adjusted. By no. any sense, but but also he's not like he he like throws chairs in anger. He shoved Fiona Apple out of a car to the ground, like Ooh. reached over, opened the door, unbuckled her, shoved her out of a car. Oh man, I didn't know that he was volatile like that. He is volatile. I feel like, and and this is also what sort of sickens me, like rewatching this movie, is I think Paul Thomas Anderson thinks he's the Daniel Day Lewis guy. Mm-hmm. This is kind of an ode to himself and his creative process. Yeah, I could see that, especially now hearing about his <laughs> chair throwing and car shoving uh, yeah. proclivities. Um, okay, so Phantom Thread. Yeah, it's a movie. Are you? Uh, do you feel this way about other Paul Thomas Anderson movies, or in particular, is this one that really raises your hackles and something that you I don't, don't like? tend to watch them so much? Like, I mean, okay. I've seen Boogie Nights, of course. Um, I've been meaning to watch The Master, but because I watched this, I'm like, do I really want to watch The Master? I don't know. But that's because also I hate uh, L. Ron Hubbard, so uh-huh. it would be fun, I think, to watch him be dissected as a person. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, no, this this one in particular, like, they act so unlike 
anything relatable that it was mm-hmm. just it's, it's hard for me to get on anyone's side and then to watch them just behave more and more strangely and also this movie has the balls to have a more interesting movie walk in for five seconds and then walk out which part are you talking about there when they're what when it's the press conference for the wedding of the like insecure lady and the rich guy, I think he's from the, he's the, the Dominican Republic. Dominican I think. Republic. A reporter asks him, "Hey, uh, are you going to talk about how you sold visas to the Jews during the war?" Mm-hmm. And everyone goes, "Visas to the Jews during the war," and then we we leave. <laughs> I want to see that movie. That's way better. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean that he sold them? Was he stealing them and selling them? Was he ripping them off for a profit? Is he a horrible man in a way that's more interesting than a guy who sews and is really particular? Uh, and then they, and then we leave and we never hear about it again. He might be taking advantage of the society lady. Who knows? Yeah, I I, I don't know oh, because we leave and go drunk? back to this weird. Uh, I I want to call it psychosexual, but this movie fails to be sexual in really any way. Like, yeah, there's no uh, there's no sex in the movie. Uh, no, there is obviously a lot of implied sex, yeah. and there's a lot of implied. Um. Well, not even implied, like very overt psycho, like the psycho part yes. of the psychosexual <laughs> drama definitely occurs. I mean, that's what happens when you have someone who doesn't know how to communicate with anybody uh, except for ba- it's kind of his sister, barely. Yeah. And also a woman who feels so upset that a man won't give her attention that she decides to poison him over and over again. Uh, (laughs) That whole thing. I mean, the whole thing is just really, uh, it's nuts. It's nuts. And like the, I don't know. And then like the line at the end, kiss me before I'm sick. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, ugh. Well, because okay. they they edit the movie right at the perfect times too, where he they you know they cut after that shot to yeah. him in the bathroom with like a bowl full the of bowl, yeah. puke <laughs> that he is just oh my god. I mean, here's the so I I feel like we you know this is the similar I've I've experienced this with other movies on this uh-huh. podcast where the things that my guest doesn't like are some of the things that I like about the movie. Okay. And I think watching it again really brought some of that into perspective because you're, you're a hundred percent right. I think Reynolds, Alma, like every character in this movie for the most part is not acting anywhere close to no reasonable or realistic. No, <laughs> not at all. And I think that, I mean, obviously that's by design, but I think, feel like I was at I, I felt much more willing to be along for the ride than uh, than being like oh well I wish this was I wish this had at least one sensible person in here because <laughs> the closest you get I guess to a sensible person is is Leslie Manville's character Cyril who's uh, Daniel Day Lewis's sister and reasonable? by the way okay hold on what do you mean reasonable <laughs> the only the only reason I say this is because she is the only person to stand up to oh, yeah. Reynolds in a non in a non violent non poisoning him with <laughs> mushrooms way, where she I mean the scene between her and him at the breakfast table where she's like you should just cut Alma loose yeah and then he tries to pick a fight with her and she what is her line something like uh, don't you fucking come at me uh, I will run through you and, oh, yeah, so, and you'll like, be on the ground. Yeah, you, you, you'll be on the ground. I was like, whoa, that's a little window into their childhood, like a mm-hmm. vivid one. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean. Like, the, the, like sh- that is probably the only realistic conversation where she's like, bro, your girlfriend sucks. She's yeah. ruining everything. She's abusing you. You have to make this stop. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then she comes in. She's like, what's up? And then everyone's like, nothing. (laughs) (laughs) This is a crazy, this is a movie that like, I have no idea. Even for me, I have no idea why anyone watched this movie. 
I didn't. I, well, I, I don't know why it gripped the nation. <laughs> it did. It did. It like came out of nowhere. It was a sleeper, huge Oscar nomination. Uh, yeah. It went. It got like six nominations. Um, it was. It it came out like on Christmas Day. Really? Yeah, Christmas Day, twenty seventeen. It's like up against a Star Wars. Yeah, it was up against. <laughs> I believe. Star Wars uh, Last Jedi, oh. I think. Oh, which is a great one. But that's this movie is just full of no, no reason for anyone to watch this movie. It's a, <laughs> it's about society yeah. people in 50s London who very are fashion designers. Time. It's a very specific time. I don't know why anyone watched this. It there's made, no clearer moral. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no real message about anything universal that I can tell. I'm not even sure what Paul Thomas Anderson wanted me to take away from the film that like, I've seen it now twice. Still not sure. I what guess he was hoping I would get out of it. I mean, I guess it's about creativity and creative people, but that's the thing is like, if you look at it from, uh, from the broadest perspective back possible, and again, I'm saying this is someone who liked the movie. Yeah. Is <laughs> uh, Daniel Lee Lewis's character does not change who he is on a deep level. Like, none of the characters right. change, none no. of them grow. They just are forced to, every once in a while, be poisoned so that yeah. way they, <laughs> they like. have to go throw up for a little bit. Achieve equilibrium. It's really, it's really weird. It's really fucked up. And I think that there's like, there is a lot of comedy in here like some of the the delivery of the lines i found very funny um from daniel day lewis like uh it, it, it but there's just like there's no reason for anyone to watch this movie this movie is a is the most niche of niche pieces <laughs> there is yeah like it feels like it's aimed at people who thought you know uh downton abbey was too broad mm-hmm <laughs> They're like, hold on, this is too mainstream. I need uh, something a little bit tighter and right. more English. And yes, more specific. just a little bit more. We need something where put, people are putting secrets in the clothes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was kind of interesting. And then I was like, I don't see how this connects to the rest of it. And then, like, th- there were flashes of Reynolds being a, an interesting human, and mm-hmm. then they kept rolling it back and making sure he was not really a person. Right. Because yeah, you're really just watching a, uh, a really nasty caricature of, uh, of what it is like to be a high functioning. Um, like I, I guess, I mean, I don't want to even <laughs> just say creative person because yeah. this is really, this really paints people who do any sort of creative profession in a bad light because oh, it, it makes them assume that if they're all going to be like Daniel Day Lewis in this absolute movie, absolute psychopath. Like, uh, uh, there's <laughs> too much noise at breakfast. Like, yeah, that part is so crazy. And you have, of course, sound design wise, they have to crank up all the little butter scraping oh, right. bits just, just to make you feel that crazy. And uh, uh, to to not be wholly negative. Uh, kudos to all of the like art and production design. Mm-hmm. They all killed it. Sounds are great. Editing, as you mentioned, there's some perfect cutting. The lighting is really interesting. Visually great. It's just that everything happening in the movie is awful. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really fucked up movie. Like that's a, I I. It's not an easy movie to stomach, and I think <laughs> I think that there's. I don't know. There's something to be said for, I guess the the real thing here is like, why do I like this movie? Even though everything That's that happens question. in the movie is abhorrent. That I wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough. I mean, that's a tough question to. I don't. Ha- I don't know if I have the answer to it yet. So okay. this is. So I'm going to ask you this. So maybe yeah, okay. we can. Maybe we can dig out the reason why <laughs> by helping me understand some of the other reasons you don't like it. So. You're watching this movie. Yeah. First going, time. Ugh, why? At, at, at what point did you start feeling that feeling? Like, is it was it pretty quick or was it a really slow burn of like, okay, I, I'm into this. And then all of a sudden something changed. 
Uh, I think it's when he starts, tr- like, because they, they, they meet at the restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. And then they start hanging out. Right, and then they do the kind of the dress scene. I was like, okay, where's he? He's kind of uh, ma- like maybe this is his deal. He always takes a lady up to the attic and you know fits makes her for a, a dress, dress for her. <laughs> and then he starts being horrible very quickly, yes. and she doesn't go. What's your problem? She, she's like, uh, I'm, I, I, I got to stay in. I'm, I'm committed. Like, why? You spent like thirty seconds with this guy. Why on right. earth? It's even, yeah, say? I mean, he's even horrible to her in the dressmaking scene, too. The, just the quick flashes of stuff. Oh, wait. Even in the diner, he's a, he's a shitty customer. I, I, I forgot. He goes, uh, let me see it. Are you going to remember? Oh, like, yeah. Like, why would you ever? <laughs> I forgot. I even and forgot then he that. takes the paper from her yes. to, to fuck with her even more. Who would tolerate that? And then, and then try to go fuck that customer? I've never met a server who would get off on that i wonder if i wonder if he read whatever the like the 1950s version of the game was (laughs) like reynolds is the original version of mystery yeah he's just (laughs) okay now that you say it this is very he negs at the restaurant he takes her to a second location he has a weird uh kino he's he's upping Mm -hmm. the kino like oh my god so much kino (laughs) <laughs> this is and he's doing reverse peacocking because he never dresses <laughs> like that he's always in black he even suits. hates the word chic he can't mm-hmm. stand that little fucking word uh. <laughs> oh my god that's yeah uh, that's that's what this is we figured it out <laughs> yeah. this is why i like this movie it's because i read too many i read too many pickup artist books when i was uh, an impressionable teenager what if we look at the credits and find out that neil strauss was a consultant <laughs> <laughs> so all right so that's re- so right around there that's when you started to really be yeah, like or, i can't i when, can't when get i see him board. treating the lady badly and she's like yes and like uh but then so she starts in her uh, in her own fucked up way, standing up for herself back. Yeah, um, and that's about the halfway point is when the first mushroom scene happens, where she's right. uh, you know she goes out foraging and then she looks up to make sure she has the poisonous mushrooms. Yeah, and uh, it's coming off of this big fight. And, you know, this movie is also it's a very small, intimate movie, even the like the big bombastic fight scenes yeah. are all done basically in stage whispers. Right. And like but, there's there's no glowing portal in the sky or anything like it's very right. like the stakes couldn't be smaller. Right. Which is uh, it, it It works, I think. But also I think that like it's just it adds to the level of tension and, and fucked upness. I don't know why. Why do people like watching fucked up stuff so much? Anyway, this is a question. We're <laughs> trying to figure out that question. Um, so she goes and she forages for the mushrooms. And that's basically the halfway point in the movie. That's that, right. that's smack dab in the middle. And then uh, there's the, the whole first poisoning is very dragged out. That whole yeah. sequence from the time when she grinds up the mushrooms and puts them in his tea to he recovers is a, probably a solid like 20, maybe even 30 minutes. And there's not a whole lot of movement that happens there. You just mm-hmm. see Daniel Day Lewis like hallucinating and and telling people to fuck off. Yeah, which was very fun. Yeah. The little, <laughs> the little, little boy doctor comes in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a strange boy in my room. <laughs> See, I think that's part of the part of the problem with this movie is that it is it is classified as a drama, but I think it is much funnier than people like I didn't expect it to be as to laugh as much as I did the first time I saw it. I don't I, I didn't laugh this time just because I knew it was coming. <laughs> but I remember watching the first time and as soon as like Dan DeLuce goes like, I don't give a tinker's fucking curse. Yeah. It's like, what is that? What is these lines? Which this is great. Well, because the the phrase is I don't give a tinker's damn. Mm-hmm. And so to change it to Tinker's fucking curse is very funny. Like that's and that's funny <laughs> stuff. And I would guess that that was Daniel Day Lewis because uh, there's a there's a couple bits where you can tell that they're improvising, mm-hmm. and it's usually kind of like ugh, ugh. <laughs> like the 
the one where they're arguing at the table and he like tells her to get out. Right. That that one's like clearly an improv on like the sixth take. So yeah, where he's like, like right. "Do you have a gun? Are you here to yeah, shoot me? Yeah, <laughs> do you yeah. have a gun? Why don't you just shoot me?" <laughs> but that was it was like at a level of absurdity that was fun. But I think I think that was de- had to be all Dan Day Lewis. Probably that just didn't feel like a line that was written out. I don't know. I could I I'd I'd buy that happening. I could see Daniel Day Lewis wanting to, I guess, swing for the fences with a very short, small bat in his final. <laughs> film um i remember there's a lot of a lot of praise that got uh put on uh vicky cripes for this role also and i i think the like which the, one's vicky cripes Sorry. she's, she's uh, Alma. Alma. Okay. yeah the sister is leslie manville who got uh, oscar nominated and i think i think vicky oh. cripes got a couple nominations for things but not for an oscar but this movie I mean, the characters in the in the movie are all. I can't. It's you know what it is. It's just that I don't. I, I I'm so glad that I don't have people like this in my life that I can just oh, watch yeah. them from a distance. I think that might be really what it is. Because <laughs> like I have no I have no patience for people like this oh, really not, anymore. Yeah. And I I getting a chance to watch them be like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with this. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Yeah, I, I mean. But also, like, I mean, it's not that far off from some comedians I've met. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> the way, especially the ones who are like aren't famous or rich or or or, or funny enough to behave this way. Oh yeah, like, <laughs> oh. I think about that a lot. And like this, this guy, like, what does he do? Oh, he designs dresses. Like, mm-hmm. okay, that's no, you're not. You don't. You don't add enough to the world to take this much away. Right. But yeah, <laughs> it is. It is definitely nice. I think you're right to to like be able to imagine those people and then watch them kind of suffer yeah. for a couple hours. Yeah, I think that that there's that's the kind of gratification I get out of this movie, <laughs> I think. Is that I know I would imagine that even as absurd as these characters are, people like this exist cuz I've met people like this. I met I've met and worked with comedians and writers who are to some degree like Reynolds Woodcock. Um, but I don't have to deal with those people all the time. And I get to just watch this happen and be like, Oh yeah, that's why, that's why I don't deal with these people. Cause I would want to poison them and kiss them or something. <laughs> I don't know that, that analogy didn't really play out, but you see what I'm getting at. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I see what you mean, but I think it's done to such an extreme here for me that I'm just like, I can't follow along. Because why doesn't Alma just leave at the top? It's because they have a movie to do. So the only reason right. she stays and hangs out is because otherwise you wouldn't have a movie, which to me is always just like the laziest way to, to keep a character around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if there, yeah, that 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 is true. There's definitely no reason for her to stay, and she is <laughs> no given reason. ample opportunity to leave early yeah. on in the movie too. I guess that she just. I don't know. People always in people in movies tend to like as characters, they fall in love or they stick around for reasons of love in a way that no, for the most part, human being actually would. <laughs> right. And Alma definitely falls prey to that. She she is that character to a T where she's just sticking yeah. around until she finds her own poison filled agency and <laughs> and does something about it. Um <laughs> I have a question for you, which is if you were to do anything that could fix this movie, what would you do? Like, how would you change it to make it something that that doesn't feel like watching a nightmare that you want to escape from? Do do one thing, anything. It doesn't have to be just one. You can change. You could you could also just throw this movie in the bin. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I mean, I would love to do that. <laughs> but I think Alma needs to react more like a reasonable person mm-hmm. to his insanity. And then I would like to see him either succeed at changing or at least try and fail to change. Because as it is, we're just watching a rich guy be a piece of shit the yeah. whole time. And nothing really 
bad happens to him as far as he's concerned because he ends up liking everything that's going on and he stays rich and powerful. He doesn't even suffer for like molesting a lady in her bed at her own house. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens to him there. He still gets lucrative deals, which is realistic. I mean, rich piece of shit guys don't change and keep succeeding upward and upward. Oh so yeah. So I guess I have to give the movie credit. <laughs> Especially on the ones who molest people and don't do and nothing Especially. happens to them. Especially. Yeah. But I think <clears throat> I, would, I would just I would just make it a little I just wanted to be a little more grounded. She could still wind up deciding to poison and be in a weird, you know, psychosexual S and M setup with this guy. Mm-hmm. But I just want to hear her go, uh, dude, you're being a little weird. Like it just towards the top. Explain these weird and then like have him go, Hey, you know what? You're right. Even if he's lying. <laughs> I just want a little bit of them being realistic. Yeah, because the closest we get to that is there's a flash of it, I think, that happens when Leslie Manville and and, uh, Vicky Creeps, Cripes? I don't remember. We're going to call him Cyril and Alma because that's a character's name. (laughs) It's easier than than trying to pronounce a Belgian lady's name correctly. (laughs) So Cyril and Alma are sitting at the breakfast table after the whole you're moving too much fiasco. Yes. And she's like, yeah, he has uh, – maybe you should take breakfast elsewhere because he's very he, – if he has a bad breakfast, it throws off the rest of his day. <laughs> and that's the closest we get to any kind of explanation of he's yeah. a little bit of a weird guy. Yeah. Well, so that, that that like felt like the like the, – the, the person with the, the, with the like alcoholic partner who's like, I'm sorry, he's not always like this. He just, mm-hmm. you know, when he has too many drinks, he has to. And they're like, uh, clearly you both have a problem, but thank you for acknowledging right. what's happening. Oh, my God. Yeah. Honestly, these people all needed to go to like a CODA meeting or Alan <laughs> or something. Something. <laughs> Obviously, like, I don't. Maybe like, Slaw. I, I actually <laughs> would like to see a short film prequel. That's like Cyril and Reynolds as kids just to see what happened. Yeah, I feel like that would be interesting too cuz I want to I we get we get a little bit of the stuff with the mom. There's mm-hmm. the hallucination and he talks about uh seeing the mom in his dreams early on in the movie. Then he, you know, talks about like sewing her into the fabric of the clothes. Right. But there's that's another movie that like is hinted at in this movie right. <laughs> and does not exist. Movie. It's Walks more interesting. In it goes away. Yeah, I wish that there, because because seeing any of that would at least allow for the opportunity for the audience to see Reynolds Woodcock change. Yeah, even if that changes from being uh, a a normal kid who experiences a trauma that causes him to act the way he does as uh, as a horrible fashion designer. <laughs> Or uh, or the other way around, and maybe he's able to to shed the drama through his uh, mushrooms experience or something. <laughs> that that would have been a really interesting ending where we where we discover that that's actually changed him somehow for the better, and that's that's an even more twisted, interesting way to go. Is that mm-hmm. the poison somehow makes him like a more better person, but instead. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, I feel it. I feel it all coming up in my throat now. Talking more <laughs> about it. This is, uh, yeah, this is a tough. It's a tough movie. It's a. It's, you know, I'm a big. I'm a. I'm a big Paul Thomas Anderson fan, <clears throat> and this movie definitely feels. Uh, although there are some similar elements character wise, uh, as far as you know, a bunch of broken people. Paul Thomas Anderson is not one to yeah. make movies with the fun time, fun time Charlie's right. in there. Right. <laughs> but this movie really does. It, it's just, there's something that's very uh, acidic at its core. I think like even the master, which I, I do think you should, you should check out. And, okay. uh, and if you don't like that, then maybe we can <laughs> have you back on for <laughs> another PTA twofer. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the master, there's a level of, <clears throat> uh, there's a level of like empathy for uh, the lead who, who's played by Joaquin Phoenix, Freddie Quell. Um, 
because you can see that he's just trying to find something to cure his own uh, PTSD. Sure. And in, and you don't get any of anybody who you're rooting for in this movie. There's no. like, you don't, I, it's even uh, in like Boogie Nights, like mm-hmm. you want Don Cheadle to get that loan. Right. And, and, and like when the guy's in jail for being a pedophile, a character goes, yikes, and leaves. I feel like in Phantom Thread, they would go, this is entrancing, and like stay and hang out with the pedophile, and then they right. would just stay a pedophile for the whole film. Yeah. Like, this has no, I don't, no one really wins, especially not the audience. And that's the crazy thing, too, because like, in There Will Be Blood, right? Another character, I mean, you're rooting for Daniel Plainview, but you also don't like Daniel Plainview. Right. He's a, clearly a, a, a bad dude. Yeah. But at least you find something to do to root for him. I'm not rooting for Reynolds Woodcock. I'm not rooting no. for Alma. I'm not rooting for anybody in this movie. No. It's just, not even the doctor. No, not even the I doctor. Not even the doctor. He's just this weird aristocratic doctor who doesn't care that much that his patient went to. He goes, okay, well, I got, he told me to leave, so bye. If there is anybody I'm rooting for, it's the drunk society lady who's hearing yes. the Dominican Republic. Yes. Uh, the Dominican yes. guy. I hope that marriage is real, and I hope he pays for his war crimes. I hope so. Uh, but we'll never find out what we'll happened We'll never there. find out. We'll never know. <laughs> so, in closing, yeah. if there is anybody out there who thinks that watching this movie and then they're like, I understand people who make stuff now. I understand artists. No. What do you think those people need to actually see like and hear and know? Like, what do they need? Like, is there any movie out there that you feel like does uh, a better job of showing that, hey, artists are not all horrible malcontents who hate everybody and Uh. will ruin your life from the inside out? Um, let's see. Well, so many movies about artists are made by self-loathing artists. Yeah. That make us all seem crazy. You know what? (sighs) This might sound wild. I feel like don't think twice. Oh, that's a good pick. (laughs) Because they do seem often they're sort of crazy and immature, but they're at least we we at least understand why. And in the end, some of them choose to be healthy, mm-hmm. and then they're more successful after that. After they make the choice to be healthy people, and some of them even go, you know what? I can be healthy and an artist, and I find this other way. They like found this other improv school and just do some stuff there. Right. And Gillian Anderson chooses not to do SNL and just teach, and she's doing great. Like. I feel like that one ends on the up note of you don't have to be a fucked up weirdo to be an artist. You can choose to be healthy and still do art and people will still like you. Yeah, that's a really good pick. And I also think that helps because Mike Birbiglia seems to be a pretty well adjusted person. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And it's, you know, it's better. I think we need more art from well adjusted people. I would love that. That would be great. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I guess. Well, I mean, the, we, the more we watch <laughs> people who are, who are aching on the inside, create stuff. We're just perpetuating the cycle and we're poisoning ourselves with the mushrooms. Yes. This, <laughs> this, this, this movie is the poison mushrooms of film. <laughs> There's no, no reason to get it. And you only have it because someone else is making you watch it. Um, I would, I will also say the only thing that I think that could, that could really send this movie to a new height for me and perhaps put it atop the, uh, the PTA, uh, chain is if it did a huge tonal shift (laughs) at the mushroom trip part. And guess what? (laughs) Psilocybin mushrooms. That would have been incredible. (laughs) Like suddenly like (laughs) Jimi Hendrix kicks in. Yeah, he starts making way, way more interesting dresses. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. All of a sudden, it goes from it becomes boogie nights in its yeah. own way. <laughs> yeah. He he starts designing costumes for really elaborate mm. porn. Yeah. And then there's a cameo from Don Cheadle. And yeah. and only the first half of Boogie Nights. Nobody nobody gets shot. Nobody oh, kills yeah. themselves after watching their wife get railed. This no. is 
That's all we need. We need that's how we connect the PTA cinematic universe. <laughs> do you also do that with some movies where like you rewatch, but you only rewatch to a certain point and then you just stop it? <laughs> no, I've never do done that. that. With, do you do that? With with well, with American Psycho, for the first like two thirds, it's just a really funny satire of the eighties. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. And then it goes really bad. Same with like the the the, the book is the only book where I had to like skip pages because it was too disturbed oh man but there's parts that are really fun i uh yeah i've never read the book i hear i i've it's, seen the movie a few times <laughs> the movie like i regretted reading it i was like i should have just watched the movie the movie's great <laughs> what's the name of the guy who wrote the book he writes fucked up stuff all the time he writes weird yeah um i almost said david sedaris but that is not <laughs> correct <laughs> Um, uh, hold on. Oh, Brett, Brett Easton, Easton Ellis. Ellis. That's right. Yeah, he does. He writes all sorts of fucked up stuff. I remember yeah. there was probably a time when, as a human being, when I could have jumped off into reading Brett Easton Ellis, and it was probably after I read that one Chuck uh, Palahniuk oh, story yeah. with the guts getting sucked choke. out. Right. Um, I think it's a part of choke. Or guts? Is it called? No, guts? it's guts. Choke is the one that they turn into a movie with uh, with Sam Rockwell. <laughs> Fun and light and breezy. You know who would have improved this movie? Sam, Sam Rockwell. Rockwell. <laughs> but who does Sam Rockwell play? Uh, Alma. <laughs> ah, okay, there we go. Now that. <laughs> yes, Alma. And doing it in drag, too. And they, they, they don't acknowledge it, but it's just... <laughs> He just has a, He just has a cheap wig on from Wish, but he's doing all the lines. Yes, there we go. Um, oh, you know who it, we, you know what we should do is we do, is we do a remake of this movie. Oh. Sam Rockwell plays is the Alma and Francis McDormand is Reynolds. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> and we do the full on, there were three billboards, gender flip. <laughs> three billboards outside a dressmaking shop in England. <laughs> oh man. Well. <laughs> Hopefully we can realize these artistic dreams someday. Uh, but until then, Frankie, what shows you got going on? How can people watch you and find your, your stuff? Uh, well, I have a show that I love doing every Friday night, 8 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash Wizworld Live. It's a late night talk show, but it's hosted by wizards and all the guests are magical. And we're doing more and more different things every week with the special effects like uh, the week that we're taping this, I, I I am taping by taking a break from animating a giant robot, <laughs> <laughs> no, which is going to be very exciting. Oh, I'll yeah, check uh, that out. Yeah, twitch.tv slash Wizworld Live and find me at uh, Twitter and Instagram at Wizworld Live, which is all done in character. Very cool. It's a fun follow. You guys should definitely go follow. Thanks, man. Uh, and you can find me at Diet J on Twitter and Instagram. If you like the podcast, consider subscribing to the Patreon. You get bonus content and video. Uh, you get watch alongs too, so that's fun. And now that I'm, uh, I've got a nice bank going, so I'll have time to make some bonus episodes and watch some Ooh. things. So hot to it. Um, <laughs> My voice cracked on that one because that's how much I want you to subscribe to my Patreon. Please, come on. Please. There's a $5 tier. Please, there's a $2 tier if you need a little. <laughs> um, thanks again, Frankie. This has been fun. Thank you, Jay. Uh, this has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. I almost <laughs> forgot the intro to my own podcast. What happened here? <laughs> 